It's Wrestling Observer Radio here Friday, early afternoon for us, probably early evening for Lance Storm, who is our guest. We're actually going to have two guests on this show. We're going to talk to Lance for a little bit, and then we're going to bring on Pat LaProd to talk about the passing of Butcher Vachon. But Lance, how are you doing? I'm doing well, and I'm only an hour ahead of you, so it's still mid-afternoon for me. Okay, it's not too bad for you. It's mountain time, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dave, did you want to kick it off? Sure. I mean, like, um, you know, Lance and I, we've been in contact some in the last couple of weeks, and obviously I've heard um, some of the comments that you've made. And I guess one of the things, I actually, um, about a week ago or so, I talked to Bret Hart, and we were kind of discussing, Bret, Bret was very, very vocal when he read the lawsuit. Um, and you might have seen his comments. But the one thing he said was that, you know, almost he was surprised that, like, almost nobody in wrestling was. And, of course, you were. But and I told him, I go, you know, well, Lance Storm. And he goes, yeah, me and Lance Storm. But how come nobody else? And I really didn't have a good answer for that other than the obvious answer, which is nobody. You know, Vince has that aura and nobody wants to cross Vince for whatever reason or whatever it is. I don't I don't know. But what's kind of like your your perspective on everything? And also, I would, I would the other thing I'd like to know is like when this thing when when the lawsuit broke, like what when you and you read it or if you or, or, really, or released the excerpts and everything, how did did you have an immediate reaction to it? And was it a surprise or, or kind of give me kind of your, your mindset of reading the lawsuit? Yeah, I read the entire thing. That was the first thing I did, figuring that probably best to read the damn thing before talking. But yeah, it was weird in that. And I think the way I put it the first time was never in a million years did I expect to read something like that. But at no point reading it, did I doubt it. And and I, I guess it's, it read so Vince. Yeah. Just on the sexual end rather than just the you know what i mean it's like he does like to bully people he does like power he does like control it's just added that you know the element of how he treated a woman in this case and it's like at no point did i think that just doesn't sound like him which is horrifying i guess but it's it was shocking and it and it read so textbook grooming and sexual predator behavior and you know we we hear about it when you hear about different cult leaders that do it and in a weird way i think that's where it struck me because people have joked for years that you know all the cult speak of wb they make you speak a certain language they make you conduct yourself a certain way and you know we all joke that it's the wrestling cult but it's like it is all about power and control. And, you know, we've all heard the stories of him bullying people and shoving them into his pool and yeah, that's right. forcing you to talk a certain way and say the certain buzzwords. And it's always been about control. And when it's just, okay, he's controlling you at work and he wants you to talk the way you want to talk on his television show. It's like, okay, whatever, you know, he's a bit controlling, but who cares? But when you realize the depths of, of how he was treating some women and obviously with multiple NDAs. And I guess I would have been aware of the Rita Chatterton accusation from ages ago, but it's when it all comes together and you read the details of her case and the other NDAs and the, again, the rape settlement from court with uh, Rita Chatterton. It's just like you realize that, I guess what a what a horrible person on so many levels he was because I'm sorry I just didn't doubt anything I read even though I never would have expected it. Yeah, I um it was weird because like like uh, there's there was a lot of I I'm, I you know I, I've seen a lot of lawsuits, you know, especially in, involving WWE. And in the past, a lot of them kind of fell through because of Jerry McDivitt or other things. So I'm always skeptical reading, you know, like, and I, and I know and everything. So, so it's like, I'm, I'm not taking sides. The thing that really turned me was the text messages. Mm -hmm. I saw the text messages. It's like, that's Vince McMahon text messages. That's, 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 that's how he would write a letter. That's, you know what I mean? And it's like, those are real. And, and obviously they were real because you could never, if you put that in, in a lawsuit, 
these text messages and they weren't real, the lawsuit would be out, you know, in, in minutes, right? I mean, like, and the, the lawyer would be, you know, just sanctioned to death. So just seeing that alone gave incredible credence to um, maybe not every single thing, but enough to where it kind of like really appalled me. And, you know, one of the things with the, with the Vince stuff with me is, is that over the years, you know, obviously covering Vince for 40 plus years, that, um, you know, the, um, the, you know, you get these stories every couple of years and everything. Um, and you should, you know, and, and I think what, what ended up happening was, is that I, it kind of like hit a button with me, like, wait a minute, there's all these stories and, um, there's all these NDAs and it's like, I was thinking about Bill Cosby, who Garrett and I've talked about many times before, who had this fantastic reputation and then the dam broke and then it was like all of this stuff. And I, and I always thought if it's one person, you, you never know, right? But when it's multiple people, you you have to look at it differently. And the the, the burden of of um, belief is going to go with multiple people over one person, no matter how many times he defends himself. Um, and you know, again, the the texts were just like I, I just thought, like who who would write stuff like that? You know what I mean? It's like it's like it was, um, you know, I mean, I could almost sort of see like a 16 year old boy or a 17 year old boy to a degree. But even then, you know, only like one tenth of that, that was really bad stuff. And, and it, you know, and I think like this company has been run by this guy, you know, with everyone catering to him for how many years for 40 years or whatever it's been for a little over 40 years. And, and what happened was, is he got to where he was immune from the real world, I think, and just thought he could, because he had money, because he had power, that he could do literally anything, you know, and everybody would cater to him. And and unfortunately, with the wrong person with that kind of power, it, it, I think it, it yields this result to a degree. But even then, even then, it was it was really extreme, I guess. Yeah, it it was. And I, I want to touch on, you know, Jim Valley, because, um, you know, he was is still, I would imagine, you know, so against you know, it's the company, it's the system. And while I certainly won't dispute that, I think th the rest of the company still needs to be investigated and judged. But I think there is, when you are from, like, literally day one, like, I'm talking before WWE, like, I broke in the cafe bear, and we're taught everything is dealt within the business. Do not talk to anyone outside the business about anything. You can be blackballed. Your career is over. It's the business first. And then when you get in, it's, you know, the boys against the office. Don't stooge to the office. Don't stooge to the office. We deal with each other. And then when you get to WWE, it's like, you know, WWE is it. Nothing you did anywhere else matters. And you're trained to, you know, pledge fealty to Vince McMahon. Everything goes through Vince, you know, protect, protect, protect in house. That when you, Again, you see a little bit of bullying, and it's like if you can do something in that moment to help that person, maybe you do. But again, you don't want to stooge anyone off. You don't go outside of the business. So what each person saw, like, again, I was in WWE for, what, four years and then four months when I was an agent. I was actually employed by WWE when the uh, Janelle Grant thing was going on. But obviously, she was not at shows, so I never met the woman I don't believe. I have no idea who she is. But you see a lot of bullying. And again, you know, you see the Trish Stratus bark like a dog thing, and you go, that's really ignorant. And you see a lot of stuff. But it's it's wrestling, right, which is a shit excuse. But it's nothing that you can call the cops on. There's nothing, and where do you go in WWE if it's like, okay, Vince is being an ass to somebody? It's like, unless you're willing to quit your job and go to the cops, what do you do? And obviously, you know, with the the Ashley Massaro thing really hit me. The the recent um, yeah, news. Me, 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 you know, it's funny. It's funny when that, that first came out, I thought it was like – very questionable and, yes. and and from a from a sleazy lawyer but then everything that's come out recently you know and 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 certain other aspects that haven't come out that I'm aware of 
um, made it, you know, very obvious that it happened. And it happened mostly, probably close to exactly how she said it, most likely, and if not ex- exceedingly close. And when, you know, you you kind of go through that with everything else, it's kind of like, I mean, could could I see Vince having a meeting with her going like, well, you know, we get so much out of our relationship with the military, just be quiet and 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 but but the the, the part was, was weird to me now is in, in hindsight you know not years ago is they never offered her even therapy let alone were sympathetic with her situation and and it's like okay you know you you want to cover it up and you know that, that's bad enough but when you just go in there and it's like i just roll with the punches you know what i mean because that's essentially what don't tell anyone and roll with the punches is is one thing if it's something minor, right? And you've probably had a million things in your career where you'd say, hey, just gonna roll with the punches. I'm in the wrestling business, but but not not like rape. You know, that's like that's a different a whole different ball game. Yeah, and I was like you when I when I heard the first, you know, years ago when the Ashley Massaro thing came out, the thing that hit me that I just couldn't fathom was when in the lawsuit she said that they left her behind when they came home. I was I, I just couldn't fathom that a company, any company, find the shittiest company in the world, would leave one of the talent behind. Because I've I've never done an appearance for a major company that there isn't at least one or two office people that stay with you the whole time. And I just couldn't fathom that. I'm like, that's a bridge too far to me to buy. And then I find out it's true. Yeah. And then you feel like shit for doubting the 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 story in the first place. But the fact that I think the wording was don't let a bad situation ruin our relationship with the military. And it's like a bad situation is, you know, getting stiffed on a payday. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, or having someone, you know, you know, shoot punch you in the face on purpose and break your nose. It's like, okay, it's a shit situation, but being drugged by a stranger and raped. Like, I just, like you say, I could see, and again, I'm not, justifying it or saying it was right i could see if she was scared and not really gung-ho with we need to report this we need to find this bastard i could see a company going well if you're willing to you know but we'll get you therapy we'll do anything you like how can we take care of you and if she's willing to not blow the whistle i could see a company being fine with that but to not support like you take a person overseas and something that horrendous happens to them and you don't bend over backwards to do anything and everything you can for that person is it's just mind blowing to me the other the other thing once i once i realized that it was almost for sure a real situation and then you start hearing about you know I'm, I'm, I'm i just I, I mean again not being a woman this is one that's that that i you know i i could try to put yourself in, in this situation, but but I can't. But I could just imagine, you know, living with that and, and having nightmares about that, like, you know, for the rest of her life, I would I would imagine, because that, that type of situation is so ungodly horrible. And again, like you said, it's like it it wasn't even, you know, oh, oh my God, you know, we, we need to, you know, do whatever we can for you, get you therapy and all that. And, you know, it's like an end... And, and then the, the but you know here's the here's the other thing and I mean it, it 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 does tell you certain things about the mentality of wrestling and I saw this once also at, at Eddie Guerrero's funeral by the way something very very similar um, that she did before she died wrote an apology letter to them you know about I'm sorry to Kevin Dunn I'm sorry to Stephanie I'm sorry to Vince with the idea that the fact that she said it to an outsider, to the lawyer, even though she obviously knew that it was true. She thought that she somehow breached some code or whatever it was that made her write that letter. And and again, at the at the Eddie Guerrero thing, I'll just I, the Eddie Guerrero. You know, the one thing that I that I always remember was you know Vince is there, and I believe it was Hector Guerrero, um, it was Hector Armando, and I don't want to meet, so I'm going to do both names because one of them will be mad at me for if I got if I get it wrong. But one of the two brothers looked right at Vince and just goes, I'm sorry we brought you this bad publicity. My family is so sorry to you. And I was like, 
what are you saying at your brother's funeral? You know, or actually nephew, nephew's funeral, actually, right? Oh, no, no, brother, I'm sorry, he travels to the nephew. Um, and what are you saying at your brother's funeral? That you're, you're, you know, it's like you're you're looking right at Vince and go, we're so sorry we we gave you this bad publicity. And it's like, this is, you know, I just found that so weird. But I think I agree, but I think it goes back to, and it would be even cemented in their heads way more than it ever was mine. Yeah, because they, they were born into the business. Right. The business first, no matter what. And it's like, you know, their dad was in the business. You know, their, their grandfather was in the business. Like, it's just, they would from birth being, you know, protect the business, protect the business. So I could see where they could think that. I Again, I do think it's it's crazy rather than, you know, more being upset with the fact that uh, perhaps the uh, physique standards created in the business by Vince McMahon was largely responsible for Eddie's death. Dusty said that outright. Dusty said that he died trying to be a main eventer, you know, with with very much that being the the the, the thing. Yeah. Yeah, because that was the only thing Eddie lacked was the size that and physique that well, he actually had the physique. He just didn't have the size. Yeah, that Vince wanted or needed from, at that point in time. He certainly had from, all the other tools. Yeah, from a main eventer. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, the person from a personality standpoint, he was at by that point. You know, he was top, 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 and in the ring, work wise, he was one of the best I've, we've ever seen. So, yeah, the only thing the only thing he lacked, you know, with Eddie would, would have been height. And to compensate, as a lot of shorter wrestlers do to compensate for height, you just try to get as big as possible, even though, you know, for a small guy, you know, getting too big actually works against you, I think. You know, if you're a naturally small guy. I th- but, but that's a different, that's a totally different topic. Yeah. And and, and back on the Ashley, Ashley thing with, with the apology, I was I'm trying to think of who I was talking, doesn't matter. But they were someone, and, I, and again, it was a female. And she was saying that, you know, through therapy and stuff, she realized that more so than the act of the rape, the injustice, living with that frustration and injustice of nothing being done can actually be more mentally taxing and damaging to you that, you know, the physical act happened. But then after something that horrible happening to you, and you never getting justice and no one seeming to care whether you get justice can actually eat at you more. And that would probably, cause I, again, did she, oh, it was this actually, I was going to say, did she attempt suicide? She actually, she committed suicide, committed suicide. Yeah. That in a lot of cases, it's the injustice and the frustration from that. And again, who knows in her case, I'm not going to try to get into Ashley's head, but that it's very common that the injustice and that rage inside of you that this horrible thing happened and nobody gave a damn can actually be more traumatizing than anything. And perhaps, again, with her mental state at that point, she decided to apologize because it didn't benefit her and it did damage to WWE, I guess. I don't know. But again, I feel so horrible for the women, the woman because to have that happen and have nobody champion you is just horrible yeah i i just thought about this and i'd never thought about it this way but uh lance based on what you just said what is uh, there's got to be some sort of strategy for vince to create a marginalized community out of the majority of the the wrestlers and i don't know how he looked at everybody obviously but what is the like the psychology of what you just said about her, the injustice piece of it, like is that a reason for them to leave her there? Is because she they, they want to you know maybe, maybe they wanted to marginalize her in, in a way to show that you know a, a person this can happen to somebody and, and still who's in power? Like that's a sick thing to think about. But at the same time, you mentioned cult leader and, and th- like it, it just makes your head sort of it's just to make you kind of go in a, in a different rabbit hole. I'd, I'd like it. to think it wouldn't be like premeditated to that level. I would think more than anything. And again, obviously, just speculation that it's Vince's the show goes on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Owen died. We got to make the show go on. And it's right. like, OK, this horrible, you know, this woman was raped and she's not allowed to fly right now. Well. 
the rest of us got to get back and do a show. <clears throat> yeah. But is and it just, also a way to not take responsibility? Because if you're constantly moving forward, you don't really have to sit with that. You're just continuing to push forward. I, I would imagine someone like Vince, his responsibility to him is the show. Yeah. You know what I mean? If, you know, it was, I think it was actually Brett that used to, after he had left WWE, it's like he rides his top act like a horse. And when he's done with it, he shoots it and moves on. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the business and it's the show. And if there's casualties along the way, whether they be other companies or his own talent, um, that seemed to be fairly acceptable to him. Well, he came also, you know, if you remember when he, he came up, um, with with a few exceptions, most of the talent, you know, were, were gypsies. You know, they went from place to place. I mean, it was like the show, the WWWF, always went on. And yes, you had Bruno San Martino and Chief J. Strongbow and, and some of the local prelim guys, of course, were always there. But most of the other people were kind of a revolving door every six months, nine months, a year. We bring in and you know a new person and we cycle them in and then they go, and but the key is it's it's so so whoever the guy is you know it's like they're 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 our guy for nine months, but essentially the show itself is always there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's Vince is about the show because it's his. Yeah, and and I, and I think too you know just going back to the. Control and again, this is may just be because he thinks it's best for his show on a wrestling front. But it's like you look at so many talent that were brought in, and I, I've mentioned it several times. People sort of, oh yeah, I guess in a lot of cases, it's like when you first get brought in, you get a taste of success. Then there's usually a period of I don't know if humiliation is a bit strong, but certainly pushed down the card a fair bit. And then if you survive that, you get a push again. And I've always contended that it's they want to give you a taste of how great it can be if we are happy with you and you obey the rules. And then they show you that without us, you are nothing, and they make life a little more miserable for you. And then if you fall in line, then you get the followed-up push. And so many acts come in with a big debut, and then there's eventually that down period, and then they come back up. And I, I've i often contended that it's it's a way for which, for Vince to control talent. This is how good it can be, but this is also how bad it can be. Do what you're told. Yeah. There's also, and I think in, in every walk of life, when you have success at a certain level, it's it's you you always want it to, you, you always want to get back there. And one of the things with with a lot of people, you know, and this again, another situation is is, is is for most of these people, you know, whether it's Ashley Massaro or anyone, the the their their peak of their professional career was when they were on television a lot in in WWE WWF, and then it's gone, and you know, you you as as as, as the longer it's gone, probably the more you want one more chance at getting it, which was one of the things why, um, you know, the, the, the independent contractor lawsuit that was, that was filed many, many years ago and was thrown out over statute of limitations. And one of the things that I thought was, is, you know, it's like no one is going to sue Vince until they're in their fifties because they have to have it in their head that that door is shut and I'm never getting that push again. And the rest of them, like when they're 45, are kind of just hoping maybe that phone call is going to come. You know what I mean? Like maybe the call will come and, and, and maybe I'll get my my last run because people get that last run sometimes. Well, I think that's a lot of reason why there's very few people that have spoke out anti-Vince when yeah. the NDAs came out. Because there's so limited pl- options for making a living in this business. And that's always been one of the best places to make a living. And you don't want to burn bridges. But there's, again, thankfully, I'm in a position that I'm not looking for that bridge again. So I don't have that decision to make. But it's like, to me, there's there's certain things you have to pick a side on. And uh, this one is just way too far. And, you know, I said it when, when just, bef- again, before the lawsuit came out, when the original NDAs. And there was so many people, you know, because it was, oh, it was consensual. And I'm like, 
Actually, she actually, in one case, in, in at least one case, it absolutely wasn't. That was pretty, no, pretty clear. But there was the belief, or at least the asser, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, assertion that, oh, they were consensual. And this is something, and I've argued with many people in, in, in this business and not in this business, just people I know, that they will do the, well, she always could have just quit. And I'm like, you don't understand. I'm like, go watch a documentary on sexual predators and grooming and manipulating. And it's like, you get someone who's desperate in need of a job and you're dangling that job over them. And you get them to compromise their morals a little bit. And that's it. Everybody has a line that they'll, you know, if you just say right now, it's like, I'm not doing that. But if they can, through money and power and intimidation, and in some cases shame, get you to compromise a little bit and then a little bit more, then you get to the point where if I quit and leave or if I say anything now, I have to admit to the compromises that I've made thus far, which is why people don't get out of Scientology. You know what I mean? It's probably why some people still vote for Trump. It's like if you jump off the team, you have to admit the mistakes you've made. And that's where it gets into manipulating people. And again, pick a cult, pick a group. And it's like, when there's a sexual predator aspect, it's like, you know, all of the Jeffrey Epstein women were encouraged in and convinced to cooperate. And it's like, it's, it's, you, you can't watch documentaries on this and read about it and not realize that it's not just, and, you know, using vulgar language, oh, it's like, I, you know, they just come up to me and said, blow me or you're fired. I'd quit. And it's like, yeah, because that's never the way it happens, you moron. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you know said, what I mean? Na- you said name a cult. Uh, I've, I mentioned to Dave, uh, Nexium and Keith Ranieri, there was a group of women who created a group. And as part of the participation, it was sort of like, a, oh, you're one of the chosen special ones that we've asked. You actually had to give them some sort of negative information that if it actually went public, you would be very embarrassed about to join. That was part of your participation. Wow. As well as being branded. And they realized that the branding was actually the initials of Keith Ranieri. Like that's how, how grotesque it, it got. But to your point, they're, they're not, you know, the idea that you do this isn't just, for fun and games, it's like, no, you're kind of in it for forever based on, you know, on, on what we're doing here. Um, it's it's so sick and, and disgusting. But, um, yeah, one thing one thing I wanted to bring up again, as far as like going forward and making it a better business, you know, um, and again, you know, Vince is out of the business now, in theory, and probably forever. I, I can't imagine him being brought back. The other in, in fact, at the um the TKO stock conference when Mark Shapiro started talking, it was, you know, he didn't say anything. There are no words if you read the quote that look bad. But I mean, I I heard it with my own ears. There was a very much a disdain of, you know, we don't know. We we haven't been in any contact with Vince. We don't know if he's going to sell. But I mean, it was done with like such disdain for for like whatever it was that Vince, you know, they probably feel Vince caused them, you know, a lot of grief. Um you know, of course, they, you know, they, they, they knew going in who Vince was to a degree and 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 chose to, uh, you know, make him chairman of the board even after the NDAs, which, you know, is is very much questionable. But but as far as going forward, um, you know, so much of the Vince WWE was. You know, because it, it again, Vince came from the old school of wrestling, the car, you know, heavy carny school, and and a lot of his older people. I mean, that that's the business they grew up in. So you're you're it, you're you're totally indoctrinated into it, and just, you know, kind of the power play and women. You know, women in wrestling for the most part were never, ever, ever. You know, go back to Billy Wolf or whatever. They were never treated well. You know, I mean, it was always abuse. Just you know, in, in different ways. I mean, again, like it's, it's funny, like now, you know, like a lot of the stuff that happened in the earliest days of women wrestling that's talked about um, openly, you know, is that like, you know, they would, Billy Wolf was the, the women's wrestling promoter and booker and the champion would be whoever he was, 
you know, or, or he would push the main events would go to whoever he was sleeping with at the time. And that was just, you know, part of, you know, the accepted part of, of him being, you know, the Vince McMahon of the women wrestlers in that era. So this is, again, this is where it comes from originally, I suppose. Um, but how do you change that decades and decades of uh, mindset? Um, and can, again, can you do it with people who were Vince's lieutenants for years and years? I mean, it's like people are always going like, well, this guy should be gone and this guy should be gone because they knew. And, you know, yeah, of course, like, of course, we all know they knew Vince was having affairs. That's not a question. Everybody knows that. But did they know this much? And then it's a question of like, who the, I mean, like they know what they know, but I mean, I have no idea who knew what, as far as the depth, you know, I mean, we know, um, I mean, we know that, that somebody told Vince that you can't, um, you can't make Janelle Grant a vice president because it's going to raise eyebrows, you know, you and, and, and have her salary go from 75 to 400,000 a year in one year, um, because it's going to raise eyebrows, but, but, you know, you can make her a director and get her salary to 200, you know? And so it's like, well, he, this person certainly knew, you know, enough to know, you know, what the deal was with the job, but at the same time was also trying to come up with a compromise that would protect Vince or not look so bad for the company. And that's, and, and is that a good thing? I mean, that's, that, that is knowledge. That is knowledge, you know, that, that, you know, Vince was trying to make this woman, you know, a vice president of the company, you know? Yeah. I, I think it's, it's definite knowledge of, business malpractice yeah hey, hey you can't pay your girlfriend 500 grand a year but is it knowledge of sexual abuse you know obviously with the power dynamic there's a consent issue mm -hmm. but i think you know wrestling is having to deal with what the movie industry is having to deal with what sports are having to deal with what the world is having to deal with there's been a lot of really shitty abusive men and women have been treated like shit for you know since the beginning of time yeah and and i think i think the fact that there's now such a solid base of women that i think they have at least a foundation for some support and i think as those women, like, again, you know, use TNA as an example, like Gail Kim was enough of an accomplished performer that she's now an office person now. And I would like to think that if our female talent had issues, Gail's their protection. Because, you know what I mean? It's like they can go to a woman that they respect and that they know and talk about something. And as, you know, there's the Mickey James, the Trish Stratus, the Lita's that have been in the business for, you know, a couple of decades and should have that knowledge and that veteran stance. And even just the fact that at least now the women have an entire locker room. I can't imagine, you know, the, again, the, you know, the Lani Kai's, the Medusa's, the Missy's, where it's like, you're the only woman in the company. It's like, you got no backup. Yeah. And, you know, that had to, uh, I would imagine the stories they have are horrendous, where at least now there is that. And I'd like to think that each generation gets better. Perhaps we need to speed up that process a bit. Uh, and I don't mean perhaps as it's a question, it's like most definitely. But I think now with, you know, this being out, I'd like to think that there's going to be a lot more microscope on things although again you know tko is a pretty big company they're gonna protect the company as all corporations do we'd have a similar question um question is are you at all surprised that the grant lawsuit and the ashley massaro story have seemingly had no effect on wwe's core business and given that fact, do you think that Endeavor TKO would feel justified that they don't need to take any action or even do an investigation beyond what the authorities are already doing? I think, unfortunately, fans just want to like what they want to like, and they will voice a degree of outrage for a very brief period of time. When it comes time for, I want my Monday wrestling, I want my Friday wrestling, or again, Wednesday or Thursday, whatever company you happen to support, it's very easy to fall back on that. And I think that's, 
human nature. I think that's how we all deal with hardships and things we don't like. We tend to try to move past them and forget about them, which doesn't help those that are still suffering from it. But I think that's human nature. You know what I mean? It's it's WrestleMania season. They want Cody to finish his story. And 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 then this is somewhat fair too, though. They they look at the new product and they go, you know what I mean? Like Rhea Ripley's a gigantic freaking star, and Becky Lynch is a gigantic freaking star, and you start thinking it's like can't be all bad for women. And obviously it isn't all bad. It isn't. For women. It, isn't anymore. it isn't. You know yeah. what I mean? There are women that have tremendous, great experiences in the business. So I think that allows the fans that don't want to deal with the downside of something that they enjoy. It allows them to do that. And I would imagine as soon as the heat dies down, TKO is not going to give a damn. And I, again, I don't think they're any worse than any other corporation that's worried about their stock price. It's like if the heat's gone, good. Yeah. And that's just unfortunate the way it is. But I would like to think that, you know, if the FBI took his phone and checked his emails and stuff, it's like if there's enough there, it's like file criminal charges. I think you've talked about this before on your show, but the culture as it is. If with Vince being gone, do they just assume that, okay, th- it was the one predatory monster? Or is there a culture that was created atop with the leads and the man and, and, and the management that could possibly still exist? I, I think that's a, something that, that should at least be discussed or talked about by TKO. Well, one, one thing I want to ask you, because you were back as an agent, you know, not that many years ago. And, and and you were there in the 90s, you know, um, as a, or the, the, the 2000s, I should say, um, you know, as a wrestler for several years. Did you how, how much different did you see the culture as an when, when you were back as an agent as to when you were a wrestler? Because when you were a wrestler, it was I don't want to say the height, but it was certainly certainly the certain aspects of the bully culture. We're, we're certainly very big in the in the 2000s. And, and, you know, you know, the stories of people being run off, you know, WCW people because they were, you know, and you were you were one of them. But, you know, like the, that you were different, even though you're under the same umbrella, you know, like like we're the ones, you know, who built the, the company and you're the ones who are coming in somehow and you're not necessarily as good. And some of the Billy Silverman stories and things like that have, and and other people, not even from WCW, but there were people who would who were in that company who got run off. Um, for not fitting in 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 whatever ways that you know that's just how it was. Did you? Because because again, I don't sense from anyone there that that exists to anywhere near that degree today. No, there was a gigantic difference. Like I was even in two thousand, there was still. And again, thankfully, I had met most of the guys ahead of time before I ever got there. And also Buff was a heat magnet from, from hell. So I didn't get much, (laughs) but there was still that expectation of you have to drink with the boys. You have to be one of the boys. You have to do this act this way where even as late as, you know, the tail end of my run in development, I don't know, it's still bad then, but now in particular, like I was 2019 when I went back, and I think wellness became part of the the reason why it got this way, that it seemed far more accepting to, if you're just the video game guy that goes back to your hotel and plays video games, it's like, well, these 10 guys will go with you, have fun, that's your crew. And if you're the, hey, we go to the bar and we drink, it's like, well, these are the 10 guys that go with you and you drink and you do your thing. And if you're part of the marijuana crew, it's like, hey, this is the hotel room you're in, and eight guys. And it really felt way more free to just be who you were when you're not at the show where in the, you know, two thousands and earlier you had to be. And I think it was part of that. Don't stew, you know, don't stooge off to the office. It's like, if you weren't guilty by association, there was the concern that, you know, you could stooge somebody off and perhaps get a push by pointing out that these guys did all these horrible things and you didn't and the protection for it, you know, pre you know probably 2005 i don't know the exact time it was you need to come out and be just as guilty as the rest of us and again i spent a decade 15 years because it's like i don't drink i don't do drugs i'm not going out and picking up women i'm married and I'm actually planning on being faithful to my wife and it was like the heat behind that was incredible and that is so much more different now 
And it's so much more, I think, acceptable to be, be yourself and do your own thing. And I think even too, you were much more free again in 2019 when I was there. And again, especially when it was under hunters, because Vince was launching the XFL. So he was only at half the TVs I was agenting at the time. And when Hunter was there, it was just a million times better. But there was more freedom to express your feelings and dislikes and maybe to fine tune things where in the 2000s, it was, you know, you don't do what you're told. We'll find someone who will and you're just SOL or again, wrestler's court, which was just a gigantic bullying process. In my opinion, I hated that goddamn thing. They did one when I first got there and during the invasion of all people, Howard Finkel. And one of the women, I don't know which, was to slap him. And he flinched and it looked like shit. And they I, brought remember him to, this. I remember that. And yeah. they brought him to wrestler's court. And I'm sitting here going, they just want all the WCW guys to know how horrible it can be. So don't ever risk getting into wrestler's court. And they humiliated that poor man. Oh, what a nice guy. And, and I was, you know, I, again, this is invasion time. So I'm green as shit. And it's like, I'm right on the fence. It's like, I got to get up and say something. This is fucking bullshit. But again, it's like, okay, you, you've got to pick the team you're on. We're all getting, you know, harassed and, and, you know, you're, you're WCW. You're not one of us. I'm like, if I get up, I'm done. And I felt so bad. And he, he was punished to go out and do another segment where he got slapped and he flinched again and got, but after the wrestler's court was over, it's like, Howard was crying and I went up and pulled him aside and just like apologized. And, you know, like I was almost in tears that it's like, I felt like shit that I didn't get up and say anything, but I guess at the end of the day, I was too much of a coward to do it, but it was just like, Howard is just like, he just wants to be one of the boys and do good and the best he can. And he loved wrestling. And so I always tried to make a, a habit of, you know, chatting with Howard and being nice to Howard, but it was just like, this is just wrong. Like, you know, he didn't do in, anything intentionally wrong, but I think they wanted to show us, the outsiders, what lay ahead of us if we act up. And it's like, I hated it. You know, I, I there was, it was one of the, there was that period when I was in developmental and you probably wrote about it. There was some tension between me and JBL and Bob Holly. <clears throat> And Eminem were told to, you know, they went to wrestler's court and they came to me in development asked me, you know, and I'm like, you have to go. And I even said, it's like, I think it's bullshit, but you have to go and, you know, take your comeuppance and to get past it. And someone stooged off that I told them to not go and don't listen to their verdict. So then people hated me, but whatever. But it was just so frustrating because it's like they weren't doing anything wrong. But I think it was, again, you got to be put in your place. And, and it's, it's sad because guys are like this. You know, and again, I played universe, volleyball in university, and it's like, well, you're a rookie. You get hazed. We treat you like shit. And then you think it's unjust and shitty, but then the next year you're being just as shitty and ignorant to the next person. And I think that's part of the wrestling mentality. It's like, well, when I first got in here, they treated me like shit and now it's my turn to do it to you. And that was something that I always tried to uh, Im embed in my students, that there is a respect factor and a ladder of accomplishment and show respect to those ahead of you. But don't be in a rush to be the guy that has to be higher on the ladder so someone else has to show respect to you. And there's some great guys that were, you know, 40-year vets that didn't act like you had to give up their chair to them and carry their bags for them. But there's those that do. And it's like, it's definitely getting a million times better. And I, again, for the women, I would think just having a support system of an entire locker room now and not just being the only woman out there with no support. Well, the, the other aspect for women is, is that um, women are individual stars now, as opposed to just being um, women, you know, that are on the card somewhere in the gimmick of a women's match. And if we don't like you, we can certainly find another woman to be in the women's match on the card. If you know what I'm saying? I mean, now, like, um, you know, they're, 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 they're genuine, you know, I mean, and, and that was something which was interesting too, you know, that, you know, 
they were they were kind of kicking and screaming on that one for for a while before you know situations got in place and things happened you know in their developmental system and it was kind of like how come you know in the developmental system the women are allowed to be wrestlers but on the main roster you had to still do the women's stuff and you know women weren't supposed to punch and things like that you know until I, I'm, I mean, I remember once with with with, with Paul Levesque, you know, I mean, we had, we actually had a discussion on this and, and he was, you know, we were both in agreement on how it was going to end up, and, and, which is how it ended up. But it was the time frame where, where I just remember going, you know, it's, it's time to make this move and we both know it. And it's just like, and I, and again, you know, he's speaking for Vince and it's like, well, it it can't be that, you know, I mean, it's, you got to gradually do it. You can't just go from here to here. It's got to be like this type of a thing. And, um, but it did happen, you know, I mean, and that's one of the things for, for the women now, um, you know, is like you said, with, with so many and well, like someone like a Becky Lynch will talk and, and I'm sure, I don't want to say I'm sure, cause I don't know her, but, but well, or really barely at all, but, um, the idea of, um, you know, it's it's much less likely to pull that power stuff on, I think, women now that are the wrestlers than it would have been, um, you know, even 15, 10, even 10 years ago, really. Oh, absolutely. Because they're legitimate draws now. And, yeah. you know, as much as there was many people that bitched and complained when, you know, when Sasha and Naomi walked out originally, it's like, Dude's been doing that for decades. It's like, you know, they advocate for themselves. And if you don't believe in it, you can walk. And it's like more power to them. Yeah. You you know what I mean? And, you know, when you talk about the conversation you had with with Paul about doing it gradually, uh, I did it. It was the first time I went down as a guest trainer. It was FCW still. And that's when Charlotte had just started and Becky and all those women were there. And I wasn't even allowed to train with them at that session. But the last day I was there, they allowed me to sit and do an Q&A with them. And they expressed their frustration of, we're not allowed to punch, we're not allowed to kick, you know, we're only allowed like maybe one or two moves, we can't do big bumps. And it's like, they all wanted to be wrestlers. And they asked my advice. And I told them, it's like, take an inch, not a foot. I said, train in here for the job you want, not the job they want to give you. And I said, if you're allowed to do two moves a match, every once in a while, do three. And if they don't notice, then keep doing three. If they yell at you, go back to two for another month or two. <laughs> and it's like, if they don't notice, go to three. If they don't notice, go to four. And But I told them, I said, you've got to train for the job you want because there will come a day where that door opens and you get a chance on a show. And if you knock it out of the park, you got a chance. If you shit the bed, they're clocking the door. And that was before, again, it was Paige and Emma that did the, when they did the NXT Women's Championship, and it's like, they actually did good. And to me, that was the start of the women's revolution. I prefer to evolution, because the women didn't evolve. The booking did. And it's, but it's like, you've got to take it an inch and get used to it, because if you fight too loudly, it gets shut down. You know, as far as far as like again with um, going forward, I mean, in, in in you know, in some cases, the fact that this came out, and the fact that Vince, legitimately this time, I really believe is 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 done in wrestling, and he was the most powerful man in the business by far. I, I am relatively certain there will never be in our lifetimes anyone as powerful in this business as Vince was for decades, and that this did happen to him. It is kind of a thing where people in power are not going to have that invincibility thing in their head or I'm immune from any repercussions that many, many top people, you know, Vince more than anyone did have for for a long time, I think. And I think that that just the fact that, um, you know, I have to grow up and I can't be 17 year old bully in the corporate world anymore, um, maybe. Maybe that's, I mean, that's obviously a good thing. But like when we talk about earlier, you know, one of the things was um, you talked about the changes from, let's say, 2005 to going back in 2019. And, and, and again, I remember um, at All In, at All In, Brian and I were, were, were at All In. And, and um, 
there were all of the guys that we knew that were, you know, most of the guys actually who ended up, or many of the guys who ended up as the stars of AEW, and they were kind of like their little their group. And then there were the guys that were there as guests for the convention from the 80s and 90s. And they, they were all together, but it was like sitting there with all of them together. It was it was like two worlds. I mean, the the you know, the older guys were bigger and couldn't stop drinking, I guess is the nicest way to say. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like they're they're basically they're just basically, you know, and the other guys in there were pretty clean. You know, I mean, I'm not saying nobody drank a beer, but I'm saying there were no drunks or anything like that. And nobody who just looked like a, you know, an alky or anything, you know, and it was like, and, and ever since then, or even before then, but, but, you know, it was like, it's like, it's two different mentalities. And I, I wonder, you know, because you're kind of in the middle, you know, you, 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 you bridge those, that gap completely, um, you know, from both ends. Do you think, because I, I always sensed from talking to some of the younger guys on why this happened, some of it, I think, was because they grew up as wrestling fans and saw and read about whether it's Kurt Hennig or, you know, and again, Kurt Hennig represents 40 people that we both know or names of or know personally, um, that they know about this. And it's kind of like they were our wrestling heroes, but we we don't want to follow on the bad path because so many did and they know the results. I mean, do you think that that's it or do you think it's just a change in society in general? Uh, I don't think it's society. I think it, again, I think with the, the death of kayfabe, um, the prominence of even the observer and other open publications that I really think, and again, I'm that bridge in the middle sort of, you know, me to a little bit younger than me, that the people from my era or earlier got into the business for the lifestyle. They were recruited into the business. You know what I mean? You're a bouncer in a bar. You're a jacked up dude at the gym. It's like, oh, man, you should come on down Friday night. You make like 200 bucks. You'll be a big star. You can pick up a bunch of women. <laughs> and they go, and you've talked about it. It's that I can stay in high school or university. It's like they got into it to avoid having a regular job, to avoid having responsibility, or just the you go down to the pavilion or the, um, what's, why am I blanking on the building in Dallas? Sportatorium. Sportatorium, yeah. And it's like, there'll be a thousand screaming women. You go out afterwards and they buy a bunch of drinks and the women, four of them will go back to your hotel with them and you go, man, wrestling's the greatest thing in the world. And then once we get further into, you know, the late nineties, mid nineties, definitely into the two thousands and wrestling's not kayfabe anymore. And you hear the stories of the guys dying, but you see wrestling, you like wrestling, you investigate and look into a wrestling school. And it's like, the guys got into wrestling because they wanted to have good matches and be wrestlers. Yeah. Where there was so many that, they didn't care if they had a good match. They wanted to get over so that they would be able to pick up more women and make more money so that they could drink more and party more. But, you know, not to throw him under the bus, but it's not like he hasn't thrown himself under the bus. It's like, you know, Flair talks about, you know, you talk about what cities did you like to work? He always talks about which ones had the best after hours partying. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, that was his goal where, fans today it's like oh chicago's got a hot crowd and it's like you know this town's got a hot crowd and it's like oh, i had a great match here it's like you never hear the oh there's a lot of great rats in portland <laughs> <laughs> and it's just it's a different mentality that people got into the business that were fans of it and wanted to have the great matches that they saw and they were more interested in having savage steamboat osprey um, versus Okada rather than, you know, they were recruited because they were a big guy at the gym and they hooked up one of the wrestlers with some drugs and they went out and partied and all of a sudden they're in the wrestling business. And obviously that's healthier because again, I've had so many friends and people die on me from the lifestyle of pro wrestling. And that is obviously not, at least now when you hear, you know, so-and-so wrestler died at 35 find out he battling cancer which is still horrible but at least it wasn't self-inflicted yeah 
Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it, I mean, now it's funny because when I'm writing obits and I write a lot of them, you know, there are guys in their seventies and eighties and I'm writing long stories as opposed to, you know, the, the four, the 39, 41 and the big drug history, you know, I mean, and it's, um, so, I mean, in that way, I always, I always think that like, you know, you know there there when we compare eras, I mean there's good there's good things about every era and, and everyone is gonna love I think the era that they first started has a romantic feeling for everyone. But I do think that from a lifestyle standpoint and even financial standpoint, um, even though there's still not a ton of jobs in wrestling, I think that the I, I think, you know, schedule wise obviously too, it's it's much better scheduling than than it ever was. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's way more to me, there's way more positives than negatives. I mean, although, you know, you and I can both pick apart things that, that guys do now, you know, essentially too much and, and certainly too dangerous. I mean, you know, even, you know, I mean, and, and, you know, I'll watch, I'll watch a match and I'll think it's a good match, but I'll go like, why did you nine things where he could have gotten hurt? Maybe he could have done one and I'll remember it the next day because when he does nine, I don't even remember it the next day. Well, yeah, but a- any era you can do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's, and like you say, whatever you, you know, I became a fan late 80s WCW and the Saturday Night Main Event era. So it's like I always have a fondness for that. But, you know, I watched Speedball Mike Bailey and Will Ospreay and TNA, and I sat there with this is fucking great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? I couldn't do that shit. But, <laughs> And so it's it's evolving and with it. And I think on the whole, the real thing is, and, you know, we started with the, the real horrible story, but it's like the business is a hell of a lot safer and a hell of a lot better. And like every industry, men are realizing that you can't just, oh, this is how men act. It's like, no, you need to grow up. Yeah. And hopefully more and more of them will grow the fuck up and the world will be a better place. Hopefully we don't have going forward. um and I don't, you know, we don't have these kind of stories going forward, other than the regurgitating of the old stories. And and you know, unfortunately, like when when the Nick Kaniski, Nick Kaniski story that came out a couple of days ago, and it's funny because it was like one of those things where, yeah, I you know, it's like I can go like, yeah, I knew that story. I remember being told that story, you know, when it happened, and then it was sort of like, well, that's that's the horrible part of wrestling, but now with with with, with the benefit of hindsight or whatever, it's like, I'm, I'm genuinely appalled. You know what I mean? Like, like back then it was almost, I, you know, it's, it's weirdly accepted, but it's like, gen, you know, like now with my, with your man, mentality of today, you know, you know, a, an executive comes and wants to perform oral sex on you or whatever, whatever, whatever his thing was. And Hey bud, you know, this is WWF in the, you know, 1986. And, and you're a borderline guy, you know, you can go up, you can go down. You know what I mean? You're not, you're not a guy who came in with a big reputation, but you're a promising newcomer and someone does that to you and you say no. And then all of a sudden you're jobbing everywhere. And it's kind of like, man, you know, it's, it's like, and, and, and the worst part, he told Vince, you know, he went to Vince and Vince goes, Oh, it never happened again. And then it keeps happening, you know? And it's yeah. just like, that that was that was like God. I look back and I just go like, you know, you know. I mean, you 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 know, Vince Vince. I mean, it's like it's like he could have put a stop to that stuff. I mean, he could have, and chose to you know whatever his back is executives or the talent was replaceable and 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 again, if you weren't like if it was if if the same thing happened and I'm going to throw out a name, the guy does it to ravishing Rick Rude. And Rick Rude complains to Vince. Perhaps Vince goes, "I got to get rid of this executive." But when it's no. a guy who's who's nobody, it's like I'm going to protect my executive, no matter. No, it's not a matter of right or wrong. Rude may have punched him in the face, but yeah, well, that's but, when- you know, you you tell that Nick Nick Kaniski story, but it's like, I bet you ninety five percent of women who worked as secretary in the eighties or earlier all had that exact same bullshit to put up with. Yeah. You know, I, I've talked to my mom about some of the Vince allegations and, you know, she just talks, but it's like, you know how many times I went for a job interview and was told that if I expected this job, I needed to have a shorter skirt and he needed to see some leg or I don't get hired. Yeah. It's like, 
women have been putting up with this shit forever. Not that it makes it any better when a dude has to, but it's like the world does need to get past it. And hopefully enough bad attention and, and pressure will make things better because, and again, I, I think the fact now that, like I said, there's so much more diverse locker room that, you know, everybody's got some backup now. And I think there's some, and with their ability to be public now where, Again, when I broke in, it's like if you went public with anything, you're done. Yeah. And again, no one in the public would give a shit because it was just wrestling, where at least now there's there's platforms and a chance for stuff to actually come out publicly and people are going to be hopefully more careful and act better. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, we do have uh, Pat on the line. Is there anything else you wanted to ask Lance, Dave, before we let Lance go? Anything other than do you have any, any any kind of thoughts or things of what you think the industry should do? Um, any changes or anything that you would recommend or just kind of like the idea as we talked about that it's it, it has improved greatly. And, and we're on a you know, we're, we're on the right track now. But but when we look back and look at the history, you know, there is a really ugly history that we do have to deal with. And, and it's better not to sweep it under the rug, I think. Yeah, I, I think, and it's hard because, you know, everyone's got an HR department now, but the HR department's hired by the company to protect the company. But I, I do think every company does need to have a couple point people so the talent at least know who they go to. So if there's a secretary in TKO or if there is a diva in development, a diva, Jesus, a, a woman in developmental that feels uncomfortable with a trainer, a coach, an agent, a writer, a co-worker. Where's the chain of command? Who do they go to? And they're going to have to find the right people that people are going to trust. And if anything, you know, really empower that person and have someone, again, I, I think Gail Kim with, with TNA is a great person. It's like, does Molly Holly still work in WWE? You know, could she be a person that's given a degree of power that this is the person women come to if they have any issues and she has Ariel Emanuel's phone number and could go right to the fucking top and go, Hey, we got to deal with some shit. And again, same thing in, in AEW, there needs to be someone. I don't know who that person is, but they, the talent should know who they're allowed to speak to. And there needs to be, someone that they trust because at the end of the day, companies are going to want to protect companies. All right. Thanks, Lance. Thank All right. You, thanks guys. Say hello to All Pat right. for me. We will. Okay. Take care. Yep. Hey, Pat. Hey, Pat. How are you? Hey guys. Well, I had, uh, I had better days, you know, it's always, uh, Always sad when when a, a friend like uh, like Paul Vachon, uh passes away like this. Uh, yeah, it, it, it took me a bit by surprise, but uh, you know he was eighty six years old, so we knew it would happen. You know, uh, one day, but you know it's not like he was in the hospital for three months, and we were expecting this. You know, any day. You know, so it was uh, kind of a shock today when I heard about the news. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, again, because from from the year and everything, a lot of people don't know, but, uh, you know, I mean, Paul Paul Vachon, you know, of course, came into wrestling uh, because Maurice Mad Dog Vachon was already a, a fairly well-known wrestler, and then they uh, tag-teamed, I think, in Calgary at first, and then they both had separate careers and then had the big run in the AWA, and then obviously the height would probably be when Paul was a promoter and wrestler for Grand Prix Wrestling in Montreal, when when they were in a real boom period in Montreal wrestling, um, but you know, I mean, again, his, uh, you know, he, you know, had he he worked in at, at different points in pretty much every facet of the business, I think, and in the Montreal scene, like he would have been one of the, you know, I mean, he was obviously someone who helped you greatly when you were researching the history of Montreal wrestling and because he knew everyone and, um, uh, you know, just, and then the Vachon family, I mean, not Mad Dog and Paul and Luna, 
Gideon. Um, he, he actually helped me for uh, all of our three books, uh, Bertrand Bear and myself, because there was the book on the history of Quebec wrestling, of course. Uh, there was the book on Matt Doc Vachon, his brother. And, and there was the book on Andre the Giant, because he was the first promoter to actually uh, have Andre uh, in, his, in his promotion in, in North America, you know, and he did so much for Andre. So he had stories that, that no one else had, you know, and, and he was such a great, a great guy. I remember that when we were researching about Maurice, he actually, um, he actually welcomed us, Bertrand and I, to his home. And we, uh, we spoke to him all night. We, we arrived there for dinner and we spoke all night and went to sleep. And then the next morning back at it again, uh, you know, that was, that was Paul Vachon, you know, uh, in, in 2009, uh, Mad Dog was inducted in the uh, Quebec Sports Hall of Fame, not Wrestling Hall of Fame, Sports Hall of Fame. And um, I had organized for them, for Paul and Maurice, to have one last uh, night in a wrestling ring. So there was a local promotion here, NCW, uh, who uh, did something with both Paul and Maurice. And I always remember this because we wanted just to... to uh, to celebrate them, you know, in front of the fans and give them just a, you know, some kind of a plaque and just say, hey, you know, you had, you both had great careers. Uh, but then the, 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 uh, the booker asked me if, if Paul, cause Mad Dog was in a wheelchair at the time, but they, uh, they asked me, uh, he asked me if Paul would have been up to do something more physical. So I asked Paul and he wasn't really into it, but five minutes before bell time, he comes to me and said, hey, you know what? I'm going to do it. You know, that wrestling bug was, was yeah. coming back, you know? So I said, great, you know? So we, uh, I brought him backstage, and it was so simple, you know, that during during their homage, uh, the biggest heel of the company would come. He, was, he, he called himself the king, and he would, he would come and, and just, you know, be uh, uh, just going to insult both of the Vachans. And outside, uh, Paul just knocked him out. A, a, a very good wrestling punch for for his age. Actually, he never he never lost the touch, and people just went crazy. And Paul was so was so happy to have done you know something. And it, it was the it, it was actually the very last time that both of them shared a ring together. And two nights later, Paul had asked me to organize a big family reunion for him and Maurice. Uh, so I did that, uh, and he invited my parents, which I thought was so, so thoughtful of him, you know, to, uh, to do that. Uh, I remember taking a picture of my dad with Mad Dog that I still cherish a lot. You know, it's, it has a special art place in my heart. And, uh, and yeah, so that was, that was Paul Vachon, you know, it's, uh, he, he, he was always there when I, when I, uh, when I was calling him to, to talk about anything and, and he, he was he was he was a good friend. What what kind of a, like um, person was he, and what kind of what, what were your kind of takes on him, and and um, and even his you know like one of the things like you know again like when when Grand Prix wrestling started you know it was um, kind of kind of I guess I, I guess the best thing you know when, when it comes to kind of explain to the people here you know about the formation of Grand Prix wrestling because there was you know the Ba- you know, basically, there had been one. You know, Montreal had been one promotion town from Eddie Quinn, and later the Rouge. You know, Johnny Rougeau, right? And then, um, then there was kind of a, I guess, a split for a couple of years, and and wrestling got very, very big during the split. And Paul was like, um, but Paul was like a key guy. They left uh, Mad Dog, Maurice, and Paul were the AWA World Tag Team Champions, and there was no, um, you know, they've been champions for a couple of years, and there was. And 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 the tag team title there was was a main event title. It was not, you know, third from the top. They were main event every night. And AW, AWA was one of the strongest territories in the world. And there was no movement at all that oh, you know, you've been here for three years. We need somebody else. We, you know, Stevens and Bachwinkle followed, but it wasn't like you know, we got Stevens and Bachwinkle. You know, you guys, time to move on. They left because they wanted to form um, a company in Montreal, essentially, right? Yeah, so, so what happened is that Yvon Robert and uh, Johnny Rougeau had a falling out. 
uh, a couple of years before, and and Yvon Robert was always he, he, he kept doing appearances, you know, for for uh, Johnny uh, Rougeau's All Star Wrestling because on TV and even at the Montreal Forum, you know, Yvon Robert was still such a huge star that that you know the network wanted him and and the people wanted him. So, but but him and Johnny really had a falling out. So when Yvon's son Yvon Junior wanted to get in the business. Uh, Robert didn't want his son to uh, start his career for Johnny Rougeau. So he wanted to create an opposition to uh, All-Star Wrestling. So he went, the first people that he went to to meet was the Vachans. It, honestly, he wanted Maurice first. Um, and Maurice uh, wanted his brother to come with him. So that's how Paul kind of tagged along. He went also to get Carpentier, Edouard Carpentier, who was... Uh, only being used as a commentator for Johnny Rougeau. He wasn't being used as a wrestler almost. Uh, he was more used as a commentator, but he, he, he still wanted to wrestle. So he went to get Carpati and a couple of local promoters. And together they created Grumpy Wrestling. Um, so what happened then is that they did a, a show at the uh, Maurice Richard uh, Arena, one of the early shows that they did, and Vern Gagne was on the show. And they did ask to Vern Gagne, you know, what, what we should do, you know, as far as, you know, getting things moving here in Montreal. And who do you think should be the promoter? You know, should it be Maurice or should it be Carpentier? And Vern said, neither of them. Because these two, these two guys will be your stars. You don't want your star to be the promoter. So Paul should be the promoter. And, and, and it was unexpected. They, they didn't think he would say that. Paul wasn't even a, a partner in the company at the time. He was just going to be on the show, helping his brother and helping the promotion. But he had no share in the promotion. And then one of the uh, earliest partners, uh, one of the, earlier, the, the, the promoters, uh, Jerry Legault, wanted to sell, to sell his shares. So Paul took his share and became the promoter, which in, in, uh, uh, in hindsight, it was a good decision because the promoter could not wrestle at the Montreal Forum because of the Athletic Commission. The Athletic Commission didn't allow the promoter to be uh, a wrestler. So Johnny Rougeau wasn't the promoter of All-Star Wrestling. It was, uh, it was Bob Legs Langevin who was the promoter. So, so you wanted Maurice to wrestle. You wanted Carpentier to be there as well. Paul was wrestling everywhere else. Uh, and, and they did their TV in Verdun, which at the time wasn't, uh, it was on the Montreal Island, but it wasn't part of the Athletic Commission. It was a different, it was a separate town. So they did their TV at the Verdun Auditorium. So Paul couldn't be on TV every week. He could be in Quebec City, in Sherbrooke, everywhere else, but he could not wrestle at the Montreal Farm. And what Paul did, he was really ahead of his time. He, he, he knew how to syndicate the show. So the, he had the tape of the show and he sent it all over Canada to make sure that Grand Prix Wrestling would be known all over the country, which Johnny Rougeau didn't do because he wasn't the owner of his own tape. It was a TV station who owned, <coughs> who owned the, 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 the tape. So, so that's what Paul Vachon did. And he ended up being a great promoter and a great booker as well. You know, the, the whole Andre's feud with Jonathan was his idea from, from top to bottom. When Mad Dog Vachon wrestled Killer Kowalski in July of 73 in front of the biggest crowd ever in the province of Quebec, more than 29,000 people, um, Mad Dog was supposed to face Joe LaDuke because it was the big feud between the LeDuc brothers and the LeDuc, the, the Vachon brothers. But Joe and Paul uh, LeDuc went back to work for Johnny Rougeau. So they didn't know what to do. And Paul asked Maurice, uh, who is the biggest heel in the history of the territory? And without hesitation, Mad Dog answered, well, it's Keller Kowalski. And said, so that's who you're going to face. And, and Maurice was like, but... It can happen, you know, it's going to be heel against heel, you know, that, that's not working. He said, no, you don't understand. Kowalski is a big, Polish, ugly guy. You're Maurice Vachon. You're going to be their heel. You know, pointing at the crowd, you're going to be their heel, and, and they're going to love you instead of him, and that's exactly what happened. As far as, um, like, like, what type of, like, things as far as, like, 
business wise and everything like that, where would you say, um, like, you know, the, the syndication stuff sounds a lot like what, um, you know, like really what a lot of the territories did, um, although maybe not nationally. Um, but I mean, did you get the sense that um, the Vachans and Paul in particular learned a lot because, you know, Vern had one of the biggest territories and they were on top for Vern, you know, kind of how Vern cycled his tapes and things like that and did his programs. Did you sense anything from there or, or was it just his experience from, you know, Paul wrestled everywhere, wrestled Georgia, he wrestled Calgary. I mean, all kinds of places. Yeah, I believe, I believe Vern was, was, was probably where they got the, where Paul got most of his uh, knowledge and, and promoting because that was his only experience really you know when he was in calgary was still very young he had started in 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 1955 one match in north bay against uh Dor- with, with mad doug against dory funk and some other partner i can't remember but it was just one match he stopped wrestling came back a couple of years later and then you know went to calgary with 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 maurice and and what happened is that maurice was supposed to be booked in new zealand but didn't want to go and sent his brother instead. So in the early 60s, Paul left and came back only like five or six years later. He, he went to New Zealand. From New Zealand, he went to India. In India, he did. Uh, he was an actor as well. He did some movies over there. From India, he moved to uh, England. Right, he went to he wrestled, England. Wow. Wrestled in England. Billy Two Rivers was there at the time uh, as well. And then he came back to uh, to North America and wrestled in Georgia, you know, with the three Vachons. You know, Stan Vachon was was not a brother, but, you know, he was added to the mix. And from there, he went with, with Maurice, you know, to tag in, in Minneapolis. So so really, Vern, he, 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 had, he had traveled over the world. <clears throat> but I think Vern was probably his most, uh, uh, his best influence on, on how to, uh, to, to promote things. But he also had very good instinct for this. You know, it, it, it seems like he was kind of born to do this. You know, he, he was very good to start a promotion because after Grand Prix, he did the same thing with Celebrity Wrestling, which was an offshoot of uh, Grand Prix Wrestling uh, when the Vachon left uh, the company in the fall of uh, 1973. And, um, and he started Celebrity Wrestling, which had a minor success for a very short period of time. But still, you know, at the beginning, it was it was going well. And it was, again, Paul Bashan who actually uh, did this. He, he really had a creative mind, more than people actually know. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as, like, um, um, oh, what um, uh, Luna Vachon, because um, a lot of people will know Luna Vachon. What, what's basically the background of, of Luna? Uh, well, Luna... Um... Uh, Paul is the stepfather of uh, Luna, so or adopt, uh, uh, adoptive father. So, yeah. so um, there, something happened in Atlanta where um, Luna's dad got killed in a hotel that was run, I believe, by Luna's mom or something. And Paul was staying at that hotel, and he started talking to that woman who ended up being. Luna's mom and started to uh, started to to um, uh, to uh, to befriend her and they started to be a couple and and that's really the only dad that that Luna knew she didn't really know her her, her, her real father because she was just too young to have any memories of of him and Paul is is really the only when, when I spoke to Luna before she passed away that's exactly what she told me. Paul, Paul is the only dad I, I knew. And, and, you know, being a dad is not always about, you know, the person who actually uh, conceived the child, but the person who was there her whole life. And that was, that was Paul. She felt like a Vachon 100%, you know. So, uh, so that was it. So they, they, uh, they traveled together uh, for some time. And um, they moved to Montreal when, when, when Paul started with Grand Prix Wrestling. Montreal wasn't really for uh, his uh, for his wife though, so uh, that didn't work out quite like they uh, they thought it it would. Uh, but at the end of the day, he was always there for Luna throughout her life until the day she passed. You know, so uh, uh, when she wanted to get in the business, uh, it was her aunt Vivian who, uh, who who trained her to begin with. Then she went with Mula, 
Uh, so, um, so she was really uh, everybody in the in the Vachon family considered Luna as as a you know full member of the family. So there was nothing. The, the adoptive part and the stepfather part was never uh, in question. There, she was Paul was her dad. Period. So now, now, how many Vachons ended up? Because there was also Mike Vachon. Mike Vachon was Maurice's son, but he was uh, billed as Paul's son in certain places, right? I'm not sure he was actually. I, maybe I think, I think in mid I think in mid south because because okay. because I remember Mike Vachon in mid south and I think he wrestled in world class, but I'm not sure in world class they ever said he was Paul's son. But but um, I think that you know for whatever reason that because I remember Mike Vachon as as not Maurice's son but as Paul's son even though he wasn't. And the other thing was um, he must have helped Mike get into the business though because when. When Mike Vachon was wrestling for Mid South, Paul was like passing through. It's like it was like um, it's got to be mm, 80, 82, 83, I'm going to say right around there. And I was like, you know, what's, you know, Paul was not really wrestling full time in 1983, but Paul just kind of came in and it was kind of like, what's what's Paul Vachon doing in Mid South wrestling? It was kind of weird. And he was just there, you know, he did a few jobs on TV and they 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 talked him up like he was a former star and then he was gone. So it was like I just figured he was like, you know, visiting his nephew I, or something. I, I, w- I would say I, I'm not sure he was actually visiting his nephew. I would just say that probably Maurice is behind all of this. Maurice had wrestled in Texas for a long time in the 1950s. Sure. Uh, he, he had all the contacts in the world and he was known to help anyone, especially people from Quebec. But you know, especially his his own family, his own blood, like Paul, and he did help Mike get in the business as well. So I would probably say Maurice was behind this. Uh, Paul was was part time at the time, and it was just before he he, uh, he went to work for uh, WWF because you know both him and Maurice had a small run in in eighty four eighty five. Uh, there was a, a big wedding that that they right. did, you know, on uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, right, it was a butcher of a Sean wedding. Night, exactly. The, the funny story about this is that he he, the, he really was supposed to get married to his girlfriend, and he told Vince about it. And Vince said, "Well, we'll do it. We'll do it on the show. We'll do it on TV." You know. But by the time the segment was going to happen, Paul and his girlfriend broke up. Had broken up. <laughs> So they actually hired an actress to play to play Paul's wife. <laughs> I never knew that. Uh, I, so I, so I, that, I, that's the funny part. I do know um, that the Paul Vachon wedding on USA Network. Yeah, I'm not saying that this was the sole reason because I'm sure it wasn't, but it was a key aspect of Saturday Night's main event happening. Oh, really? Because I don't yeah, know. I didn't if know was, that. Um, I don't know if it was Dick Ebersole himself, because obviously Dick Ebersole was the guy behind Science Main Event. But I remember the Paul Vachon wedding to me when I watched it's like, you know, I'm from serious wrestling background and we would never do this kind of comedy. Right. And I just thought, whatever, you know, it's like I thought it was kind of stupid. And right afterwards, someone from WWF called me and goes, you're not going to believe this. But, um, you know, somebody from NBC, he didn't say, he never said Dick Eversole. Somebody from NBC saw this. And, like, there's people who, like, want us now because they just wow. thought it was that this comedy thing was brilliant. You know, yeah, and I guess, it, 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 I, I, I mean, it, I, I guess when you look at it that way, I guess you could say that because it was funny. Um, and they said that, like, we have doors that are opening. And then the next thing I know, there's, there's you know, Saturday Night's Main Event happened. But there's there's doors that are opening really big. Because people in television saw the Butcher of a Sean wedding wow. and just thought that, like, this is this is great stuff. You know, like, certainly not what you would think pro wrestling is. And, yeah, it, 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 it definitely was, like, again, it could be only 5%, but it was absolutely one of the things that helped them get Saturday Night's Main Event slot. I, I wish I knew this before because Paul would have gotten a kick out of this, you know, just to know, just to know that, that, that fact, because if you, it's, it's, it's available on YouTube. If, if anyone, you know, never uh, watched it, it's, it's available on YouTube and it ends with a food fight 
you know, people throwing pies at, at each other. And and one of the funniest part is Kai Lolo is there, the former uh, midget wrestler, who, who actually at one point in in, the, in all this starts to swear in French, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is which is to us is is even more funnier, you know, because uh, probably only the Vachon brothers understood what he was saying, you know. So uh, so that was a funny thing. And and the, the, to to go back to Mike. If Mike was billed as Paul's um, son, it's kind of ironic because everybody thought that Luna was Maurice's daughter, really? daughter because because of of the way she she uh, she spoke. She okay. had that, right, 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 right. The voice, yeah. She had that voice, you know. And and I remember Luna telling me that the very first time that she did something on the mic in Florida, she went backstage and someone backstage told her, "Oh, your 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 uh, your Mad Dog's daughter, your Mad Dog's daughter." And she was she was like, "No, no, I'm I'm actually the butcher's daughter," you know. But he, she had that, she had that same voice that characterized so much uh, Maurice. Were you at Cauliflower Alley when Maurice got, um, you know, awarded? Were no, you there that night? no, it was oh it was god. before my time there. Oh my god! Okay, perhaps the greatest promo I've ever seen in my life was Maurice Vachon at Cauliflower Alley. He went on for ten minutes in doing a Mad Dog Vachon promo, and I mean, I'd seen great Mad Dog Vachon promos anyway. But I, I don't know if there's a tape of that anywhere. I don't even know it was being taped because it was many, many years ago. But I just remember it was it was, you know, he's talking about his life and he's there with Don Leo Jonathan and he goes like to Don Leo Jonathan, who's, you know, six, five, you know, 300 pound monster. And he goes, you know, Don Leo, you know, how many street fights were you in? And Don Leo goes, none, you know, because who's going to mess with Don Leo Jonathan in that era, especially because people weren't as big as they are necessarily now. I mean, Don Leo was a giant and, 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 you know, an athletic giant and mad dog just like looks at him and goes, I've been in over 200 street fights. <laughs> and he just starts talking about like all these people he had to fight to, you know, as you know, you know, mad dog was a very famous bouncer in, in the back and, yeah. and, and, and a tough, uh, <laughs> he must've been a tough guy because um, I remember, you know, even the tough guys like Billy Robinson or um, Danny Hodge, like those guys, would tell you, you know, how tough Mad Dog, Vern Gagne, they would tell you how tough Mad Dog Vachon was. It's actually because he was too good as a bouncer that he started doing uh, pro wrestling because he was beating guys night in and night out. And one of the uh, one of the owners of one of the clubs he was working, because sometimes he would, he would be bouncing for... Uh, uh, um, clubs that were owned by the mafia in, in, in Montreal. And the leader of the mafia was a guy named Vic Cotroni. The, the, the godfather was a guy named Vic Cotroni, who actually wrestled in the 30s alongside, okay. alongside his, uh, his right-hand man, who was an, a guy named Armand Corville. And at one point, Corville took Maurice aside and said, hey, you know what, you, you, you got to stop this job because you're beating people too many times too much one night someone will just come in with a gun and shoot you and kill you so you better you better start thinking of doing something else why don't you try pro wrestling you're an amateur wrestler you would do great and you'll it's gonna take time but you'll make money out of this business i'm i'm sure and maurice took his his advice and and started his uh his career in 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 pro wrestling uh after that and 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 Paul had a similar background. Paul started as an amateur wrestler. Wasn't, finished, wasn't Paul like a national champion level? He, he, he finished second. He, he won the silver medal uh, in uh, 1955. And he called Maurice to tell him that. And Maurice told him, okay, so now that you won a medal, I mean, your amateur career is over now. So so you're going to come with me and you're going to start you know, doing it professionally so you can make money out of this and and that's that's how he started in north bay for uh larry kazabowski's uh territory in uh in in north bay with uh with maurice uh but uh yeah i mean i mean uh, <laughs> i wasn't at the cauliflower Wally club when you you uh, uh the thing you were talking about maurice but i was in amsterdam new york remember there was the pro wrestling hall of fame sure in amsterdam new york and and i believe the photo is in is in our book uh mad dogs and screwjobs but um, 
Paul was there and Paul was honored, I believe, or Paul was just there because he was always invited. And Stone Cold Steve Austin was there, actually. And uh, or, or was it in Vegas? Oh, I think it was the Cauliflower. Okay, I was I was at the Cauliflower when Steve Austin was there because Steve Austin and I spoke for, for a long time. Okay, well, um, yeah, it, it, was, that one. it was at the Cauliflower, now that I remember. It yeah. was the Cauliflower, and I found it so amazing that both Steve and Paul had bald head with a goatee. They almost look alike. It was like Stone Cold in 30 years, you know? And I just, I, I took the two of them together and took a photo. And even when you look at the photo, it really looks like they're, you know, the father and son, you know, just because of their look. And and I remember, you know, just having a kick out of this uh, you know, unusual meaning, you know, Paul Vachon and Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know, together, you know, that's something that, that just blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's a interesting, that's an interesting thing, especially yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. So now, now, um, did, did Paul ever like when, when wrestling ended, you know, and he basically just got older. I mean, did, you know, you know how a lot of the guys have real problems dealing with the post wrestling or was he, was he fine with it? Like I had my career, I'm fine. And now I'm living the rest of my life. Or was he one of those guys that always wanted to, you know, um, that just missed it a lot? I guess. I, I, I don't. I don't think he missed it, you know. But he, he missed being on the road. He missed being with the boys. Uh, he missed that aspect of wrestling. Uh, but he always wanted to make sure that his story and Mad Dog's story would be would be heard, you know. So so that's why he, he, he collaborated to the book. Uh, that's why uh, he collaborated to Luna's uh, Dark Side of the Ring uh, episode. Uh, I did the interview uh, for them, you know, with, with Paul. That's, that's actually the very last time I saw him. It was during the, the pandemic. Spoke to him on the phone after that, but that's actually the last time I saw him. Um, and, and that's why there was also a, a French uh, movie about him and his brother called The Last Villains, uh, who really had some success here in Montreal, in Quebec. Uh, it, it was a very, very good movie uh, about, you know, him on the road and him, you know, uh, with Maurice, with his family, with Vivian. They talk about Luna and they talk about the other kids that Paul has, you know, uh, in, in Calgary, especially in Alberta. And he didn't see the, in, his children that that much and it was kind of uh kind of emotional you know because there's one of his sons who who, 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 who you know basically said I, I don't know what to say to my father we, we don't know each other that much mm-hmm. you know it was kind of sad you know uh, but it was very very well uh, well made and uh he, he always had that urge of uh of, of telling his story and 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 uh and and sharing his his his, his, uh, his stories with with everyone. That's why he wrote books. You know, he wrote books about his old uh, his old career. I think he has four books. Um, uh, you know, recounting all of his uh, all of his travels and all of his uh, all of his life and in his career as well. He was going to all kind of conventions. Was going to to uh, Amsterdam, uh, New York, to the Cauliflower Alley Club, of course. Uh, he was also just going to some uh, market, uh, uh, market, uh, market places, market fleas, you know, uh, in, in Vermont because he stayed in Vermont for a long time, and he was selling all kind of, you know, selling his books. He had cane, you know, that he was signing, that he was, that he had made done for uh, for his uh, <clears throat> his thing, and he was also uh, doing uh, Santa Claus. In Vermont for the longest time, for like oh, I didn't know that. many many years, he was uh, he was Santa in uh, in his local uh, uh, sh- uh, department stores. In his, no, 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 in his local mall. The mall? Oh, yeah, mall there, and he yeah. was uh, he, he was he was Santa there. So you know, he always liked to be with people, to be surrounded by fans or by people who just didn't know about his career, and he would just start talking to them and all that. So he was. It was really a great, a, a great, great guy. Now, did did Paul was Paul the one who called Vince as far as like to get Andre with Vince, or was it somebody else? Um, it was actually uh, Paul uh, who, who uh, well, well, Vince Senior wanted to get Andre, of course, and um, it was Paul who dealt with Vince. 
uh, making sure that, you know, Andre would be taken care of because he, he realized that um, he could have done the same thing that Vince was doing, but he didn't have all the contacts that Vince had. He didn't have the money that Vince had. And he realized that, you know, Andre... We're talking, about Vince, we're, we're talking about Vince Sr. and not this Vince. Vince Sr. Yeah, it was 1973. Yeah. Right. And he, uh, he realized quickly that, you know, Andre would be better suit, uh, better suited with um, with McMahon that, than if he stayed with Grand Prix Wrestling. So he made sure that one of the things that he actually wanted was someone to always be with Andre, someone who could speak French, who could speak English, because Andre's English at the time was was very difficult. He, he wasn't good in English, and he wanted someone, he, he wanted Andre to be protected. And that's that's when Frank Valois came into the mix, and, and Frank Valois was the guy who, uh, who, who served at Andre's... Uh, uh, Andre's, you know, roadie, you know, for for many many years, uh, but that was because of of, of uh, Paul Vachon's deal with uh, with McMahon, you know, when uh, when he, he didn't sell Andre to McMahon, he just wanted to make sure that Andre would be taken care of, and you know, probably maybe lost money out of this out of this, but that wasn't the important part. He knew Andre was special, and he wanted the world to know, and and you know, that's why he did that. So now, was was he responsible for Andre first going to work with with Vern Gagne? Because Andre worked with Vern Gagne long before, maybe not long, but it was, you know, I remember Andre Rusimov, I think they called him, and then I think they called him other names. It might have been Jean, Jean Ferre as well. But I remember Andre, the, the my earliest remem- mem- memories of Andre the Giant were Jean Ferre in the magazines um, from Montreal, and then he would make special appearances on big AWA shows. Um, and then, and, and the magazines, you know, the, the Bill Apter magazines, the Western magazines, from the start, they covered him big because, you know, visually he looked so impressive when you had the pictures of Andre the Giant with Killer Kowalski. And we all thought of Killer Kowalski as this giant man. And then Andre, you know, so much bigger and thicker than Killer Kowalski. And it's like, it was, you know, and, and, as you know, the young Andre was was um, could do some pretty athletic things when he was young. Before they, you know, partially probably for his own good, and partially just because of the mentality of this is how a giant works. You know, he stopped doing a lot of that stuff unless it was aside from Japan. You know, when he started doing kind of the, the Andre formula match, I would say. Yeah, um, if I remember, and I'm just checking in as uh, as we speak, but I'm pretty sure that Andre started. He, he, he started in Montreal on uh, June first, uh, nineteen seventy one, and I believe he started in, in AWA uh, not so long after. Uh, yeah, definitely here. So July twenty fourth, nineteen seventy one. That's the first time Bill as Andre Rusimov that he worked for Vern. So yes, it was Paul. Paul was actually doing what what Vince Senior did a couple of years later. So he was the guy booking Andre everywhere. So everyone wanted to book Andre. They had to go through Paul. And 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 the thing if you if you look at who's on the cards that that Andre uh went in the uh, you know in 71, 72, there was always somebody else from the from the Grand Prix wrestling there. Uh, either the Vachons were there, either Carpazzi was there, Valois, but there was always somebody from Montreal traveling with Andre because of the language aspect that I, that I uh, said earlier. So uh, everybody was going through, uh, through Paul, even the very first time that he was named Andre the giant was, it was because of a conversation between Paul and Dick the bruiser. So Dick the bruiser was booking in Chicago at the time. And, um, and he wanted Andre and he asked Paul, you know, what's what's his? Uh, how do you call him in Montreal? And he goes, we call him, you know, Jean Ferré, you know. And and in in English, it sounds like Giant Ferry. And he was like, but we cannot call him that, you know, a Giant Ferry. That that doesn't work. So he said, what is what what, what what's his real name? What is his first name? He said Andre. So he goes, okay. So why don't we name him Andre the Giant? And he goes, okay. And that's the very first time that he was actually named Andre the Giant before working for Vince Senior. Vince Senior just took the name to another level and popular, popular, um, made made it made it more popular. But uh, but the very first time was in uh, was in Chicago. 
So now I remember now, I don't know if this is, if this was Chicago, but I do remember a tape of uh, Butcher Vashon body slamming Andre the Giant. I think it was on a big show in the AWA, but yep. it, there's a, you know, it's, it's, I know the videos on YouTube because when they have the videos of all the Andre the Giant, all the times Andre was body slammed, Paul, Paul Vashon's body slam actually probably looked the most impressive of any of them. That that was the same show. I, I believe that was the same show that I'm referring to. So he, he was uh, in a handicap match against Paul and somebody else, right? Uh, Paul and uh, Larry Enig. Oh, really? Kurt's, uh, Kurt's dad, yeah. yeah. And 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 it's, it was funny because the way Paul told me the story, he was always telling Andre not to, you know, get uh, overpowered like this, you know, to start working as a giant because nobody, nobody had – told Andre that before, and in Europe especially, Andre didn't work as a giant. He worked as a regular guy who was doing drop kicks and, and was very agile for uh, for his size, you know. And uh, Paul was the first one to actually tell him to work more like a giant and to not get, you know, body slam, you know, from, from you know, him and from from uh person or another you know so after telling him all this they are booked together in chicago <laughs> and at one point paul said body slam and and you just body slam andre and then the way he was telling me said he, he was like i don't know why i did that because you know i I've been I've been going for months telling him not to get body slammed by anyone, and here I am, you know, body slamming him against my own advice, you know, and and he just thought it was it was a funny story afterward, but he kind of regretted, you know, that uh, <clears throat> that that he actually body slammed Andre that night, you know, but yeah, the photo the photo made the the magazines, and and you know we're still talking about it years later, but. Uh, just to say that uh, Ogan wasn't the first one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, everyone knows that, but but the the Paul Vachon body slam actually was was I, I remember that being kind of famous. I would presume that that Don Leo Jonathan did though too, right? Uh, Jonathan, I believe, uh, body slammed him uh, as well. Um, I mean, I mean, a lot of people in France and Japan, uh, people had body slammed him uh, too. I mean, I mean, there's. Like in our book, you know, we 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 go through the whole list because, you know, it's just it's just funny how, you know, they kind of wanted to reinvent uh, the story in in eighty seven. But I mean, hey, you know what? People believed it in eighty yeah. seven. So they, they did it for me. I was uh, ten years old when that match oh. happened. So yeah, I was I was nine years old. So I was. Uh, I believe that uh, that Ogan was the first one too, which is kind of funny for Montreal because they build it as the first match ever between Ogan and Andre. While you know you did that, that, that in Montreal years earlier in 1980. You know, well, you had that in New York as well. And you New know, York, was, I mean, that that was the one that was funny to me because it was a big program in 1980. You know, it yeah. wasn't even it wasn't just like, oh, yeah, they did a match in Burlington, Vermont, you know, that no one knows about. I yeah. mean, it was they were in Shea Stadium. I mean, it was a big program. And, you know, they they worked, you know, in a lot of places because Andre and, and Terry Bollea, you know, was just a natural matchup to met to make if whatever territory he was in that that, that Terry was in when Andre would come through. Yeah. It was it was, you know, the natural match because he was he would be the biggest guy and they used to put Andre with the biggest guy. That was the and, first sellout at Pulso Varina for Gino Brito's uh, Varusak promotion at the time. Yeah. 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 And so it's it's kind of funny. And then, yeah, when Vince did in 87 and the whole thing of nobody had ever body slammed him, nobody had ever beat him. Hogan and Andre never had a match. And it was kind of like, I, 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 of course, being older, my thing was just like, and you're insulting a whole generation of wrestling fans who've seen seen him, you know, because the 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 um the Hogan Andre original angle in Allentown from from eighty that played on tapes. I mean, we they played it in Los Angeles, they played it on on Atlanta TV, which is national at this point, you know. So it's like people had seen this; they knew of this program in 1980, which is, you know, I mean, seven years earlier. And Vince is out there trying to sell them, but you know, he did cultivate a new audience and to. Much of exactly. that, but but I, but I, but it was almost like all of your you know mass square and regulars and all your you know your your people who've been watching wrestling for ten years. Everyone knows that that's bullshit. But 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 you, you are know. not and you you are not the MTV generation. Dave. That's why. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but it's funny when we say that that because 
if they did that now of something seven years ago, today, seven years ago in wrestling, everyone remembers. Because, oh, well, the, the internet changed everything. Yeah, so much yeah, tape, you know. so much. It's, it's, it's a much footage. smaller world than yeah. it was in, in 1987. You know? Because now, I mean, like, you know, people will bring up, you know, like things from, from – you know, 25 years ago, but back then 25 years ago was like, you know, wrestling fans, the wrestling fan um, cycle, you know, was, was much smaller. Like yep. the, the whole thing was built around the idea that we may hook fans for three years when they're young and then they're going to move on. Then we just keep hooking fans and hooking fans. And, and so there's no long-term stories or anything like that. And now, I mean, you could do an angle based on 20 years ago and most of these fans are going to figure out what it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, much different than it was uh, pre-internet uh, days, uh, and it allowed for a great feud. You know, uh, we 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 talked about this uh, many times, Dave. But you know, the Andre Ogan feud is really the backbone of WWF pay-per-views. You know, it was yeah. uh, it yeah, was it, the, the first the first Rumble was built around the uh, the big. Uh, uh, the big uh, contract signing between Ogun and Andre for February 5th in Indianapolis on on uh, on, on NBC, NBC. On, on on the main event, and then SummerSlam was built around uh, Andre and DBZ against uh, against Ogun and and uh, Macho Man, and then uh, you had before that you had Survivor Series, which was Team Ogun against Team Andre uh, right after WrestleMania three. And, and Andre's uh, back surgery. And then WrestleMania 4 was built around, you know, the rematch of, of uh, Indianapolis between uh, Ogan and, uh, and Andre. So, so it was really the backbone of, of those early, uh, you know, what we call now the, the, the big four. Well, you know, it was that, that feud that really uh, was the backbone of, of all that. So it was, you know, probably one of the most, if not the most important feuds in, 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 in history. Yeah, you're right. Oh, oh, then, that, they yeah. Read, then they go to the very first SummerSlam with it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The very first SummerSlam was the Mega Bucks against the uh, against the Mega Powers. Exactly. So, so they they went full circle from WrestleMania three to um, uh, to WrestleMania four, and then uh, SummerSlam. So, I mean that that feud was really uh, uh, really really something that helped uh, shape what WWF was at the time. Yep. We probably got to get going because we've been on for two hours now. <laughs> Between because we did we interviewed Lance before you. Yeah, of and, course. I, I say I say hi to Lance as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Pat, I want to thank you for sharing your stories and and I know it's a little bit of a tough day for you, but yeah. appreciate you coming on. Yeah, I appreciate it too that you can come on on such literally short notice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was important for me. You know, Paul was was a friend. He, he helped me so much. Uh, in the last 15 years, and I, I just wish that I could have, I could have told him one more time, you know, how much he, he uh, how much he helped me, what he meant to me, and you know, I didn't have that chance, but I hope he, he, he knew, he, he knew it. Someone I spoke to, someone who was very close to him, uh, and she, uh, it, it was the, the producer of of, her, of his movie. And she told me that, you know, Paul, Paul loved you, you know, he really, really appreciate you. So I was like, man, you're going to, you're going to have me start crying again. But, uh, he meant a lot for me. It went a lot to me and, and, uh, just, you know, uh, we're losing the wrestling world is losing, uh, uh, what I, I do call a legend. And, and I think he was in many ways. And, but to me, you know, I'm losing a friend and just hope that he knew, you knew how much he meant to me. Dave, you and Brian coming back after Revolution for the next show? Yeah, Sunday night after the Revolution pay-per-view, yeah. All right. I uh, want to thank Pat for doing this on short notice especially. Also want to thank Lance Storm for coming on. Uh, so for Dave, I am Garrett. And to everyone, thanks for watching and listening.